Hi, uh, morning everybody. And welcome to the first uh, Tech Talk of 2021. It is back to business for you or back to usual business for most of us. So I thought I'd discuss something seeing as a uh, um, the yeah, compliance auditors have been hard at work for the last couple of weeks already. I thought there's a, a document that we know of that we hardly ever deal with. So let's get straight into it. Before we get to the actual document, I'd like to just um, please note on, on the screen, it says an, an interim audit process. It is something that uh, through uh, Steve Brown, Herman and them, and all the compliance auditors, we've been having our online training sessions and our webinars. And guys, this uh, COVID thing is not fun. It, it's not something to be toyed with. So as far as being responsible is concerned, the following decision was taken to minimize physical contact and in order to follow the regulations set out by the South African government amid the country's battle with the second wave of the coronavirus, plumbers should not accompany auditors when their work has to be audited for the time being. Um, I'm just going to pause there for a little bit. I know some of the guys um, actually insist or they ask to be there. Should that be the case, the agreement is still that you do not gang up on the homeowner 99% of the time when the auditor phones up to book an appointment with the uh, homeowner. They will ask you, are you coming by yourself or they, they'd they like to have that security or that sense of security that we're not going to be flooding the house and that. So as an interim measure, then it is not expected and we preferably don't want the plumber and the auditor to be there at the same place. But part of the training then puts the responsibility back on the, on the auditor to say that the auditor will therefore give clear feedback after an audit has taken place and you are free to ask that allocated auditor how this process will work in more detail. In other words, I've gone into the ceiling, I've taken three or four photos, there's a mistake on one of them, I can forward you that. You go to your dashboard, we've got this new system, we can chat, there, there, there are a hundred ways to actually get the message across. So as an interim measure, just bear in mind that you might not be at every single audit, you'll be informed about it. And obviously if it was a, a decent audit, uh, nothing will happen after that. But if it needs to be refixed, then it's obviously then back between you and the client. So this is just a heads up as far as starting audits in 2021 is concerned. Okay, back to the document. We all know that issuing a COC part of that whole cycle that happens around uh, uh, logging a COC is that a certain percentage gets audited. So right from the word go, it was never intended to be a, a stick approach and just keep failing plumbers or have the auditor walk onto site and tell the plumber X, Y, and Z. So this document that we're referring to or that we're going to deal with today has been around just about as long as what the COC is concerned. It's called a disagreement with PRB audit. Whether you are, let me just get my hand out here, sorry for that. Whether you are old school or middle of the school or heap and high tech, there are a million ways for people to communicate and get their message across or get their point across without it becoming a whole palaver or getting involved in all kinds of weird and wonderful things. So. The document starts off by saying there's an email address where you can mail the completed form to, or you can even fax it if you still have one of those, or you can go on your PC. So get your paperwork done and get it sorted. So the document itself, you'll see I broke it up into a couple of little snippets just to go through it and make sure that we understand what we're getting ourselves into. Obviously, you start off with a date. You submitted the dispute, so you can't, um, so if the date is there and you haven't had a response, you can refer back to I uh, submitted a week ago. There are time frames involved in all of these various uh, questions. You'll see some, some of them sound pretty straightforward or some of them sound, um, what would you call it, um, run of the mill. But once this thing is filled in completely, it allows the person that deals with this query whether it be with the, the, the uh, compliance auditor office or the PRB office with Herman and them, it gives them access to 
um, the whole situation. So the date is there, the name of the registered plumber, in other words, who are we dealing with? Um, the whole um, putting a face or putting a company or putting a person behind this query. Your PRB number gives the person dealing with this access to all your information. In other words, are you uh, or are you allowed to install solar, your company details, your actual contact details, your audit history. So your PRB registration number on that form makes life simpler for the person that is actually going to look at your query. Then when we get to the next section, it refers to the COC number. That COC number is unique to the person that bought it, is unique to that specific uh, job. So that COC number then allows the uh, person doing this investigation or inquiry to refer to a specific audit, what type of installation it was, where the work was done, which auditor this job was allocated to. So uh, over and above your client's details and the address and contact details, should we need to go back or should we need to contact uh, for an additional appointment. O all of that just gets filled in there and we make sure that that's complete. So whoever deals with it, guys, it's down to saving time, making sure that when you fill in this document, it's not to complicate or to stall the whole refix process. It is simple. You submit the details and it gets looked at at this like uh, an immediate level. It's not something that gets postponed. Okay. Now we get to the human being portion of it. Have you discussed your concerns directly with the auditor? Simple answer, yes or no. Once you've ticked the box, be honest in your motivation. If the auditor looks like a 200 liter drum and he came there with an attitude slapping the gate open and what have you not, please note it like that. With all the training we get and with all the uh, webinars that we attend on soft skills and that, that shouldn't be the case. But on that specific audit, be honest, say you tried to talk to the guy or just state your case in as plain and simple English without having any hassles there. And bearing in mind that if you specify the reason, you know, I can't see eye to eye with this auditor, that does not mean that the IOPSA compliance office is going to withdraw that auditor from your work. But in most areas where there are sufficient COCs being logged, we are privileged enough to have multiple auditors in a, in a region. So if a second opinion needs to be obtained or the evidence is not necessarily enough provided by yourself or the original auditor, and now with a new system when you can load up all these picks and you can put notes and all these things, it shouldn't be the case. But if we do need a second opinion, it, it's easy enough to get someone in there. So when you are specifying the reason, be honest, be straight and, and just put your case so that whoever looks at it can just make sure that you they get the facts straight before we actually look into the whole situation. Okay, very important. Please guys, did you attend the audit with the inspector? Yes or no? It's a simple question. It's got huge ramifications or it's got a, a, a knock on effect. We all know this whole training thing where you attend uh, course or where they they teach you how and they, they tell you about this broken telephone system. We do not need someone misunderstanding an audit or misunderstanding a comment from the auditor or whoever was involved at the time coming back to your office saying, you know what, that guy says we should take out that whole geezer. It's an absolute mess. And in the meantime, it could have been something very, very minor. So the question is, have you attended? Yes or no? And if you have not, make sure you get the correct information. And then straight on to that, if you were not present at the audit with the inspector, have you actually been back to that property after that audit? In other words, if the the, the guy that attended the audit or the, the notification from the auditor came in and said, okay, you need to replace that whole mess, that thing's gonna fall on people's house and what they or into their bedroom and what have you not. Have you actually gone back there to satisfy yourself that Yes, it's a factual statement or look, this guy might have been on another job. Maybe they got the COC numbers mixed up or something. So if you have not attended the first time, if it's possible before you start this whole process, go to site, make sure that we are actually talking about the same thing. And guys, please, it applies to 
insurance replacements, new installations, a desktop analysis is not enough to ensure that work complies. You know as a, as a plumber, if someone had to send you a picture and say, I would like a quote to get this thing fixed or moved or, or uh, installed, you would not be able to do that 100% confidently unless you've actually gone to site, look at the lay of the land, look at what is available, look how, what distances are involved. There are a number of things that you cannot pick up up on a, on a normal desktop analysis through looking at some pictures and that. So make sure that we get that information sorted at the same time, please. And this, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you is why very few of these disagreement with audit forms actually get submitted. Please detail why you are in disagreement regarding the audit specifically relating to the transgressions of the standards and or bylaws. Okay, so what happens now? Um, I've done it like this for 20 years. You know what? My journeyman slapped me at the back of the head when I was 16 years old and he's been telling me for 30 years that this is how it's done. None of those things matter when it comes to putting black and white or putting a reference to a specific rule regulation which which is by law you need to be able to motivate why you think or why you are of the opinion that the auditor might have it wrong we're all human beings we do make mistakes and i can tell you from experience that when it comes to auditor training these mistakes get pointed us to out to us by management regularly guys please don't do this don't assume this don't add this don't fiddle with things we're talking facts, we're talking getting the information out there first up. Now, on that day, obviously this could be anything related from um, if you brought a piece of galvanized iron pipe from Gauteng to install here by me in Port Elizabeth, that you'd get shot down because of our, our bylaws. There are various different rules for various different areas or in that area where you need or where you work, you need to be familiar with what is happening in that area. That's over and above the, the normal plumbing standards, regulations and all the other paperwork. So on that subject or while we're looking at referring to the standards, I'd just like to bring something to your attention here. When you're dealing with standards and bearing in mind that you are not going to be sitting opposite the person that is actually going to be assessing your your application or your submission. So you need to put in writing, whether it be uh, photographic evidence, whether it be whatever, whatever you submit, you need to be in a position where you refer to something in detail. So. Let's look at the first one here. 4.3.3 from SANS 10254 of 2017. Take note of 2017. So then you read that portion and it says it needs to be balanced pressure and residual dynamic pressure at the fitting shall not vary by more than 20%. But now the requirement of this requires that the layout and the pipe sizes shall be correctly calculated in terms of SANS 10252 part one. Great. So 10254 tells you what you need to do or what needs to happen. So now you go to SANS 10252 part one. And that document in 2018, or this being the 2018 version, you can see there's 6625. It basically, it's a almost copy paste of what 10254 says because these standards do end up talking to each other. But then if you look at the bottom, it says here that in terms of SANS 10252 part one, to ensure correct flow pressures taking into simultaneous use of other draw off on that same line. So all of a sudden it's not only the pipe size, you need to understand that if you're putting a 22 mil pipe, but there are nine draw offs on that same point and six of them might be used at the same time, it affects your balance pressure. So this standard then refers to, or this, yeah, this standard under the references will have the water standard and that puts in there. Two years prior to 2018, 6624 went to 663. There was no 6625. So you need to make sure that if you are going to be quoting standards, firstly, okay, let me just get to the next slide. That, that might be easier. There we go. 
the reference documents are indispensable for the application of this document. In other words, if you do go to the front of 10254-2017, you'll find that there's a note that says that these de the reference documents are indispensable for date and 10252.1 of 2018 or 10252.1 is actually in there. And for dated references, only addition cited applies. In other words, if that thing said 10252.1 of 1994, that would be the addition. But for any other undated reference, which this 10252.1 happens to be, the latest addition of that reference document, including any amendments, actually apply. Information on current valid national and international standards can be obtained from the SAPS. So make sure that if you are going to argue your point, which in, in many cases is valid, make sure that you refer to the correct standard or the correct edition of the standard, because if you have an older um, version or an older revision, your reference might not even exist in that document like I showed you on the previous slide. Then, lastly, or the last sub or part of the submission, other information. Please detail any other relevant information. Take note, relevant information that you may feel you need to bring to our attention. So now you, you have taken some nice pics and the uh, auditor had an issue with your timber supports. So you've taken pictures, you've done X, Y, and Z. There's a specific model of a specific geyser or heat pump, hot water cylinder or heat pump or, or whatever that is being debated or that is being queried. Um, the, the most recent one would probably be the end of last year we had an issue with fixations. So the, the requirement is then straightforward. You have got an X, Y, Z model of this fixation. It's up to you. Just make sure that when you talk to your supplier, can this thing support a 200 liter geyser filled with water or 150 liter geyser with water? So when it comes to your actual manufacturer's installation requirements or something that is not contrary to a standard, but in addition to a standard or an add on to what was done originally, please bring that to the attention, include it. Make it part of your submission so that if whoever sits down reading your, your disagreement will say, you know what, guys, oh, we never took this or we never bore this in mind when we looked at this thing already or when we looked at it originally. So any information that you feel is relevant to your case or to your submission, please include it and, and make sure that you actually get the assistance that you need. Remember, this document was always intended to assist the licensed plumber Instead of you getting on a plane, flying up to Vera Park, knocking on PRB's door saying, I'd like to talk to who's in charge of the um, auditors or the audit process or flying to see Mr. Brown down in KZN, um, you don't have to do that. You've got a one page document. It's an A4 sheet that needs to get some information done or you fill in information and that states your case. Whatever you add on to that is a bonus and makes it more clear. It's a it's a bargain. Then the last bit, like any decent document that you submit, the declaration says, I declare that the information given in this form is true. In other words, if you are going to be arguing your disagreement with audit form, this form is not for, um, I don't have the money now to go fix it, or you know what, I'm not going to go fix this because the client still owes me money, or I'm not doing this because that builder is starting to use another plumber. We're all human beings. Things upset us. We, we, we get into things emotionally. But when it comes to a declaration, the definition according to one of the million dictionaries out there is a statement of a claim formally and specifically setting out the facts and circumstances that make up the case. So there's no room for emotion. It is a statement that is specific and formal. Because remember, once you've submitted this thing and you've signed on the dotted or you signed in that little block and you've dated it and you've said, this is me, you've done this to my audit, I'm not happy. This thing is going to progress. That auditor for that for that COC will get approached. If the, the, the photos on the system is not enough, there might be a second trip out there. I know of, a, of, of some cases where uh, we've had Steve Brown get on a plane and actually fly down to that region 
because there were one or two issues in the same area. And yes, some wins for the auditors, but some wins for the licensed plumbers as well, because no, none of the IOPSA or PRB management walk around with blinkers saying, you know what, you're wrong, and we're going to bash you for that. You have the opportunity to state your case. If your objection makes any sense at all, and you've submitted a decent enough document, there's no reason for this thing to be addressed. And what makes this disagreement with audit form so nice is that once you have faxed it or once you've emailed it, there's no suspension or you know what, you've gone past the uh, given uh, refix date and you've done nothing because you've got proof that you had this the order done and within that initial period you have submitted this disagreement thing and now there's proof of it on the system and you are awaiting the feedback so that would be put on hold or it would go on to a uh, let's call it a different folder so, so you're not going to get whipped for something that you never did because you've notified everybody up front that this is actually what's happening so guys they for the the the, the people that have not used this form before Good on you and just bear in mind that if you do need to use it it is available i normally take one at the back of my clipboard when i go to an audit and i'm sure most of the auditors do for the simple reason that it is not the intention of the audit process to get to someone's house and get into a heated debate um, in front of a client which is unprofessional to start off with and at that moment in time, you might disagree on a spelling mistake or there might be something very minor where you go off into that little cool off period and you go, you know what, that might have been right or that might have been, let me just phone this plumber and chat to him on a, on a more sedate uh, level. The point is that these things are available. If you can't, if you did, if your auditor does not have one, you can get one from PRB themselves. Have these in your office. Make sure you don't get involved into getting um, into fights. We, we spend so much time. I say we, sorry. The OPSA and PRB spend so much time on soft skills for our auditors, making sure we don't offend people we don't do this and we don't do this but we are all human beings you approach me with a red rag floating in my face and start shouting at me and calling me names and that chances are as professionals what i try and be we are going to disagree definitely so just bear that in mind so if you if you you avoid that fight put it in writing the thing will get resolved on your behalf or well by a third party Thank you very much for joining me this morning. I'll chat to you again shortly.